Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Colligan, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of Fairfield's Alumni Relations Office. This is the first event in a brand new virtual series that we are starting called Alumni Stories, Lives That Inspire. And I have to give a special shout out to Carolyn Rizikas, who is on the Zoom this evening. Many of you know her from her time in campus ministry. And this series was really her brainchild. And I just I want to express how grateful we are to her for helping us get this off the ground. Now, with me on the screen are Father Jerry Blazczyk, who is our alumni chaplain and special assistant to the president, and Eric Clayton, a member of Fairfield. Fields class of 2011. And Eric is the author of Cannonball Moments, Telling Your Story, Deepening Your Faith. And he's also the Deputy Director of Communications for the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the United States. We are so excited to have Eric here with us to kick off this series. And we know that you're going to find his story inspiring. Now, before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. We ask that you please keep your microphones muted to minimize any background noise or distractions. And I also recommend that you use speaker view rather than gallery view in Zoom, just to keep the focus of your screen on Eric and Father Jerry. And finally, we encourage you to use the chat feature to submit any questions that you might have for Eric, and we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible in the time that we have allotted. And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry. Thanks so much, Jessica. And let me reiterate our thanks to Carolyn, uh, we've been discussing this possibility and vetting names. And for Carolyn, it's just a trip down of the years of her service uh, to uh, Fairfield University. Uh, Carolyn, you've touched so many lives, uh, and it's a, it's it's a, it's a privilege for us to offer this series. Uh, and it may it also be a tribute to you and to the work and to the effect of your ministry here. Uh, at Fairfield. So thank you, Carolyn. And Eric, thank you for giving us your time. And thank you to Allison Kennedy, your good wife, whom you met here at Fairfield. Uh, you could be, of course, taking care of Ileana and Kamira, but no, she's, uh, she and you have decided that you can give us and your fellow alumni and friends this time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Now, as Jessica mentioned, uh, Eric is the author of a remarkably uh, insightful and spiritually helpful book called Cannonball Moments, Telling Your Story, Deepening Your Faith. We'll say more about this, and I'm going to ask Eric to say more about the title itself in a few minutes. But the subtitle, Eric, is Telling Your Story, Deepening Your Faith. So, Eric, let me throw it right back at you. Can you tell us your story of how you got to Fairfield and what was, if you were to write the story of your time here at Fairfield, what would be some of the, uh, some of the chapter headings? What would be some of the moments that as you're making sense of those four very intense and beautiful years, how do you tell the story? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's, that's exactly right, right? The, I, the sense of making sense of, of the story um, you know, long after it's 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 happened, and 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 continuing to do so. You know, I um, I mean, how I came to Fairfield that that story is is probably slightly uneventful. Um, that, you know, like I, I you know I I found the campus, I, I found the school size. You know, I kind of put it in. How close was it to my my home in, in Philadelphia? Um, and it checked a lot of boxes. And, and when we got there, I said, this is um, this is this is great. This is where I want to be. Um, you know, I had been educated uh, in Catholic schools, uh, you know, for, for a long time, and, and, and that was a serious part of my life. Um, but I had no familiarity with the Jesuits or with Ignatian spirituality um, at all. So, so that was a, you know, part, a lot of what I, I discovered at Fairfield. So, I mean, certainly that would be a chapter heading um, in and of itself. Um, you know, so I, I graduated in 2011, so I entered in, in 2007, right? And, um, and and some of the key things that that made up the experience for me um, were, you know, certainly uh, a lot of campus ministry uh, stuff, right? All the stuff, you know, I was certainly, you know, I met Carolyn through Eucharistic Ministers, as, mm -hmm. as so many folks do. Um, and that was formative. I, I entered that as a as a first year student and 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 was all throughout um, and then I had the chance to, to lead, help lead uh, in senior, my senior year. Um, I did a lot of the, the service immersion trips. I, I went to uh, Magis um, in the Philippines the, my, my first summer, which was a real opportunity, really awesome opportunity. Um, so it was a service period in the Philippines, and then we, we ended at World Youth Day in Australia. 
Um, and I did other other service trips. You know, I went to Nicaragua. I had some I did a research uh, a project in Nicaragua. Um, I got to study liberation theology yeah. with, with Dr. Dr. Lakeland. Hmm. Um, and so all of this, you know, kind of um, began to help me make sense of how um, faith could inform me as a person. Um, and and uh, and my the things I studied, I studied creative writing and international studies, which a lot of mm -hmm. folks are like, well, why? Like that seems like the two very random things, um, very disparate things. Um, but for me, I was always thinking in, in terms of, of storytelling, which, which sounds like a, a shameless plug for the book at this point, but it's, it's true. Um, you know, I, I, I mm -hmm. thought of storytelling um, within this context of, of international studies. Like, what are the biggest stories you can tell? Well, stories that take place like against the, the backdrop of, of all of the highs and lows and challenges and sufferings and joys of, of living in the world. Um, and so a lot of that, mm -hmm. you know, going abroad to do immersion trips, um, studying stuff uh, that happened, um, you know, that, that affects, you know, global politics and, you know, geopolitical realities, um, you know, was, was kind of piecing together this, this narrative uh, for me um, and who I might then be in, in the world. And I think that was how, where that faith piece became so pivotal, right? Because, um, you know, what's the story that we, um, we tell about ourselves? How do we put ourselves into the, into the world and, and what drives us, the, what's the why that ultimately animates uh, what we do. And I think that's um, really, really key. You know, I, it sounds maybe a little cliche, but I think it's, um, it's actually a real like deep well to, uh, to, to mine. Not Eric, to that sound like, I'm sorry, that sounds like a lot of the questions that uh, we, any of us who have worked as mentors or have been involved in the uh, Ignatian Residential College sounds, it sounds like echoes of the three questions. Right. Yes, you. You. you for, I forgot to mention my my uh, very pivotal time in the Ignatian Residential College. Um, uh, Father Jim Mazik was was there, and, and he was a good friend and mentor. And then um, Father Jim Bowler was my uh, is still my spiritual director all these years later, and um, were two very key pivotal pivot, pivotal people. Um, and those questions, right? What are the three questions of the Ignatian Residential College? Who am I? Who's am I? Who am I called to be? Are the questions I I I use to frame the book. Um, and not again, not because it, you know, it was a it was a cheap a cheap trick or a way out or um, blatant plagiarism, but because um, but because those are questions that continue to resonate, um, you know, all these years later. And um, and questions. It's funny because as I you know as I just in my in my day job and the work I do, um, they're, they're questions people kind of reflect back, and so they're they seem like trite questions, kind of surface level questions, and then you kind of delve into them, right? And you realize, oh, these are these are questions about like all the stuff that matters, you know, who, who am I? What's like the meaning of me? Um, and how does the meaning of me kind of collide into the, the meaning of reality and, and, and what happens as a result? Where does this uh, fascination with storytelling come from? Certainly, and uh, it's, it's evident from everything you, that, you, that you do in your blogs and in your meditations and in your book, it's clear how much you're shaped by the tradition of the storytelling of the scriptures and uh, your, uh, your, the example of Ignatius and the spiritual practice that he encourages us to, uh, both through the examine and through uh, the meditation on the stories, contemplation stories. But you seem to have storytelling in your blood. Is that, uh, is, um, am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to, I um, I always, I always trace it back to uh, my grandmother would tell me stories, and um, and not like family stories, like passed down, like legacy stories, but um, I, you know, I have these images, these memories of of sitting in the back seat of of like the car, you know, like in the Target parking lot, um, and she would weave these stories of of these kind of fantastical creatures, um, and always uh, put me and my friends in the stories. That was always the key, uh, the key bit. You know, who who's in our story today? And and you know, I would rattle off these names, and and um, and then you know me and my friends would go on these adventures that she would um that she would you know kind of pull out of out of nothing and that was um in part i think what stirred in me this this love of stories as well as you know a love of, of science fiction fantasy speculative stories i'm a big star wars guy as you can tell by all the things behind me um lord of the rings all that kind of stuff so that fantastical nature of of reality you know we were just at the at the renaissance fair and my daughters had the chance to um to see a real live mermaid uh, which was which oh, was a real live mermaid great Listen, it was the coolest thing, but but um, you know, but just that kind of suspension of belief and that 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 dip into the into the 
you know, the impossible, um, you know, and you see their eyes light up. And I think that that's what like these good stories do, right? They, they help us to imagine something greater than ourselves, beyond ourselves, you know, that they ask the what if. And I think in a lot, a lot of ways, right, that's what Ignatius asks us to do when we do this imaginative, story, uh, imaginative um, prayer, right? We sink into scripture and, and we tell a different tale, one that we're a part of, right? Not, not terribly unlike what my grandmother did for me. Um, you know, you, you put yourself in the scene and then you see what happens and, 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 and anything is possible. And I think that's, um, you know, that's that storytelling. I think that's faith. I think that's, that's just kind of, you know, living life with a disposition to, uh, to, to the curious. Right. Um, and, and I think that that, uh, yeah, you know, you're right. There's, there's, there's a key piece of prayer in, in this, this storytelling um, work. Um, but there's also um, imagination that has to be developed um, in all different facets of life. So sometimes, you know, in front of mermaids. It strikes me that, you know, we're very, uh, soon, soon we're going to be, you know, we've had our, uh, our Magis core uh, in place for about two years now, and we're going to continue to work on the core, the core curriculum here. And soon we're going to be launching, I, I understand, a real focus on, we promise that Fairfield's going to really make its mark as a place uh, for the arts. Uh, it sounds that all of this uh, is of a piece with the kind of education that helped you um, confirm your own personal vocation as a storyteller and uh, as using story and literature and art and imagination uh, as a way of entering more deeply into the mystery of life and of God. So would you say that, I'm not trying to set up the answer, but it sounds to me Correct. like, you know, the Fairfield, the, you know, that component of your Fairfield education served you well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I think the opportunity to, to walk into a classroom where we're, we're doing work in um, creative writing, right, just, you know, conjuring stories out of, out of nothing, um, and then to walk into, um, you know, a, a, a independent study on liberation theology, right? Those things seem very different. And yet there is this sense of how can we imagine something better for, for the world, right? How can we imagine something new um, for the world? And I think that there's actually a, a lot of similarity in that, right? Because because I think good, good justice work, um, you know, good anything, good innovation, entrepreneurship, it all, it all necessitates that imagining something new uh, and then trusting in that story to unravel. And, and, and I think what you, what you alluded to earlier too, right? Like, do we, do we see those pieces as they're laid out in front of us you know, in, in real time? Most likely not. But as we, as we kind of you know, collect them in, in, you know, in the past and then you know, begin to observe those patterns in, you know, in the present, you know, then, then we begin to become more attuned to those things. And, and that's the work of, of the examine, right? Thank you. Uh, Dorothy, you had a question, but I, it, it flashed before me so quickly I couldn't get it all. Would you like to ask that question directly, Dorothea? Or, or else just text, send me the text again? Or, or I just, don't remember it. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're getting as bad as I am. I have to think about that, but thank you, Jerry. Jess, do you have it? Do you get the text if, if folks send them to us? It doesn't look like it went to everyone, so if you may have just sent that directly to you, so I don't see it. Okay, if you, Dorothy, if it comes back to you, please share. Anybody else want to ask any questions or make any comments at this juncture? Please. Edna Garcia, Paul, I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome, Edna. <laughs> any other questions at this stage? Now, with this education that you've described, we see if we leap ahead, we can, we can appreciate, as you've told your story, kind of how you've gotten to where you are now. But there were many intervening chapters, which uh, the, the exact storyline of which had to have been rather murky at certain times. Is that true, Eric? I mean, it wasn't when you were graduating from Fairfield, what how did you construe what your next steps were going to be? Right. Yeah. So I um I um I had two like, very divergent opportunities after I graduation. I had a, an internship um, in international tax law at KPMG, right, right there in Stanford. Um, and literally, the only qualification was the um, the word international. I think in the in the title and then in my degree. Um, and um and so I had I had an internship that turned into a job, um, or 
uh, I had been accepted to, to do a, a little less than a year of service in, in Bolivia, just, just, just under a year. Um, and that seems to me uh, the more, you know, it seems logical at the time, oh, I've been doing service immersion, uh, you know, I say international studies, Bolivia is the obvious next chapter. But then looking at the KPMG opportunity, I was like, oh, well, there, this is, you know, a solid salary. This is a, um, you know, a good, a, you know, nearby. It's, you know, it's, it's a place that I enjoy living in this area. Um, and, and uh, you know, so it's international in title. Um, and so I, it was a real, it was a real like discernment process, you know, which, which way should I go? And, and ultimately, um, you know, I, I, I looked at kind of what I, I mean, there, there are two goods, right? You know, good, it, it's good discernment. There's two goods there to look at. Um, but looking at kind of me at the patterns in my life and, and, and bringing that into kind of um, dialogue with, with the, the, the opportunity at KPMG, I realized, well, this, what I'm appealed to, what I'm attracted to in this, in this job is really just the money and the comfort, um, not the challenge, not the, you know, I haven't been like training for this. This isn't what I've been working towards. Um, this is probably, I'm probably attracted to this opportunity for the wrong reason. Um, whereas the Bolivia piece was was um, um, certainly less le you know less comfortable, a lot less money, um, but uh, seemed to kind of reflect some of those patterns that were at work in uh, in my story so far, um, and and seemed to fit more, and and it was more attractive to me in that sense. Oh, like this this could really deepen some of the things that I've been after. So um, so again, I, I don't want to say like you know one was better than the next. I just think one was right for me uh, versus you know one was right for somebody else. And so when I went to Bolivia, you know, I, I entered with, uh, like, I think that was the right choice. And I think looking back now, it was the right choice. But, um, but the dis disposition I brought to that experience wasn't quite right. And so I, I struggled a lot. I had a hard time connecting with the community and, and kind of getting over my own, um, my own sense of what this should be and, uh, you know, my expectations. Um, and so, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know if, if that. If yeah, that was... say, yeah, I think, you know, I think it brings us into a, a possibility for the discussion of why you chose this topic, uh, why you chose this title. Um, was Bolivia a cannonball moment or did it provoke a cannonball moment? Uh, and do you want to say something about why you're using that phrase, a cannonball moment? Connected yeah. to that is, was your Bolivia discernment a failed discernment? Yeah, good, good questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I mean, like, so cannonball moment, just for, for everybody, um, right, comes out of the Ignatian tradition, which I know everyone on this call is probably familiar with, but, you know, I had that sense of St. Ignatius is, is you know, uh, goes to battle, he's struck by the French, um, the French forces at Pamplona. He has the opportunity to surrender, um, but doesn't, right? It's his pride that keeps him there. Uh, and he gets a whole bunch of folks killed as a result. Um, and, and in his, uh, you know, he, he's sent home to loyal to recover. So he has literally a cannonball moment as him getting hit in the legs and being, you know, very much turned around, um, reassessing his life and how he approaches his life. I think really grappling with the pride, you know, that, that, that factors into his story. Um, so the cannonball moment is that kind of trajectory turning, a disorienting dilemma. Um, and I think for me in Bolivia, yes, you know, it was, um, it was a little slower, right? I didn't have any, you know, grievous wounds, but there was this this kind of slow unfolding of I I've come with the wrong disposition. I, you know, there's a lot of pride or ego um, or expectations um, of other people, not necessarily of myself, um, or maybe the wrong expectations of myself. Um, and so there, uh, it wasn't a failed discernment because as as I look back, certainly, but even then, it was. Kind of the clear unfolding of, of what I had learned in, in Fairfield, it was a really good challenge uh, to, to, to and kind of a um, you know not everything goes smoothly right in in a, in a right in the correct discernment and then kind of fitting it into my story where I've been it was really important to where I am now so it was it was the correct thing um, even if I brought the wrong disposition um, and I think the key thing for Ignatius's cannibal mm -hmm. moment is that recovery time in Loyola where he has all that time to to reflect and pray and kind of hear the whispers of, um, of God. And I think for me, that really came into factor then the year after where I was, um, you know, grappling with these kind of random array of internships. You know, I was in multiple cities, um, kind of anchor lists, figuring out like, did I, where did I go wrong? What did, 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 all these questions? Um, and that was my opportunity to kind of listen to that, uh, that, that whispering of the Holy Spirit. So that was your Loyola. That was your recovery time. Yeah. I would say so, yeah. As you construct the story, what's the next chapter, Eric? 
So when you uh, look back and say, what was God doing in my story? You know, and Eric, you know, when as I hope you all will take the time to work your way through, because it's really an exercise book in the Ignatian tradition, Eric's book. Um, I, Eric will be reminding you and us constantly that um, even the effort to try to construe a story is already an implicit act of faith, mm -hmm. that your story is not something that is random, something that is chaotic, but that it is woven together uh, by, by a creative, loving God who is uh, active in all things in our lives, active even in what you would, uh, would characterize as your poorly motivated, maybe even immature expectations when you're in Bolivia. God was at work in all of that, uh, determined right to bring you through that to a new place of greater freedom uh, and, and greater self greater self-awareness and greater availability uh, to yourself and to God and to others. So when you're constructing, question for Eric, I'm sorry, uh, what was the discernment process actually like? How do you tune into God? Uh, the, the person who asked that question, Erica, you're welcome to, to amplify that if you wish. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, Eric Roland from the class of 97, and uh, thank you for sharing your story. I, I'm intrigued by many parts of it, but in particular, as you talked about that fairly significant fork in the road decision that you made. And um, I'm curious if there were <clears throat> there things that you did to, uh, again, I, I phrase it as tuning out the noise, and, um, you know, as I reflect on 25 years since graduating from Fairfield, it seems like there's just more noise to contend with uh, in this day and age. But I'm curious what that was like for you, if you recall. Did you go to quiet places? Did you go for walks in the woods? Did you spend time at the Egan Chapel? What, what was that like for you to tap into um, that discernment process? Eric, are you asking about his discernment to go to KP and G versus Bolivia? Is that the one you're right. Okay, right. thanks. thanks. Yep. Yeah, no, awesome. Thank you. Um, so uh, first you hire Jim Bowler as your spiritual director. And then, um, so I um, I have a very distinct memory. I was uh, I was an RA in, uh, uh, in Loyola, uh, in the Ignatian Residential College that year for senior year. And I remember being in the room and, uh, and Father Bowler had said something like, make a pros and cons list. Um, of these things, but then he gave me, um, let me see if I can find the book. Um, he gave me, this is actually still his copy of this book called The Discernment in Troubled Times. Um, uh, and uh, he, he gave me, I forget what chapter he gave me, but it was essentially the chapter on the two standards. Um, and the two standards is a, is a, is a, one of the key meditations in the spiritual exercises. Um, and and um, in short, right, you're looking at, um, you know, the way of Christ and the way of kind of the, the enemy, uh, and they're marked by these two, you know, standards. Thus the name, um, and you know, Christ, the downward path, downward mobility is uh, you know poverty, humility, rejection. Those are kind of the, the markers, and then the enemy's path is uh, uh, pride, riches, and honors. I think, um, and um, so that so I kind of made this pros and cons in my dorm room. I, I wish I had you know gone somewhere better than that, um, and um, and and I kind of then then put them against those two standards. Um, and I still like do this in, like, instinctively in my own like day to day. Uh, um, I, I just found that so helpful that the two standards uh, meditation, and that's and that's how I I kind of, I really came to realize oh like what I want out of the KPMG job is really just kind of comfort and money, um, <laughs> and and those aren't bad things right. It's not like that's a that's an evil thing in and of itself. Um, and, but but there was a sense to me that I was like oh like that that's not necessarily what I. Like, like where, I've, where I've been coming from, like, it's not what I've been working towards. Um, not that I don't like comfort and money. Like, I don't want that to be like the, the takeaway. Um, but, but, the, but, but once I kind of put them in that, you know, what were the pros and cons? And they just kind of perfectly aligned with like, you know, the, the enemy standard. Um, then things became a little clearer. I was like, oh, like, I don't, I don't know if that's, if I have the right reasons for this. Now, if I had been studying accounting for, for four years, um, you know, if I had been, you know, if I, like my family owned an accounting firm, like if I had this kind of great tradition behind me that was, that was pushing me towards that. And, and I, I did my pros and cons and it was like, oh, like there's a family legacy to live out. Or there's, um, you know, like I, I know how accounting can help people, you know, better manage this. Like if that had been on my pros and cons list, then I think 
th the answer would have been different, but I didn't have any of that. Um, that wasn't part of my story. Um, and, and, and what was in the story was that sense of, um, of international studies, um, of kind of what's a good story to tell. And I was then thinking about how would Bolivia be interesting kind of raw material for storytelling. Um, and so I think once I, once I kind of layered them that way, uh, it, that, that's kind of how it unfolded. Is that, is that get, get to it? Is it? That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Eric. Yeah, yeah, of course. Anybody else want to ask Eric for clarification or maybe offer your own view in response to what Eric said? I mean, we've always fashioned in our minds this kind of our meeting together as an opportunity to share, uh, provoked uh, and inspired, in, literally inspired by the story of one of us, but uh, please feel free. Okay, that being the case, Eric, next chapter, when you're telling the story to yourself and to us, what are you seeing? What's, what stands out as the mark of this next chapter? Yeah. Or to put like it I'm another not... way, what, 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 what was the gift in, in, uh, that, that, that the Lord was fashioning in you and for you and through you? Yeah. Um... I feel like I'm giving away the whole book now. Um, the, uh, yeah, it doesn't so I, mean you shouldn't buy the book. Still, get the book, get the book. <laughs> um, I know, you'll know how the story ends now. Um, um, yeah, so so I, I had, when I came back from Bolivia, you know, again, mm -hmm. trying to sort through what had happened, I think I had felt a real um, sense of, of, of abandonment by faith. Something went wrong in my kind of faith life, um, and I, I want to put distance between that. And so the, the various jobs I did, um, that following year were very not related to, to the faith life. Um, and, uh, and, uh, sorry, did someone say something? Um, okay. And, and so I remember, so I remember, um, applying for like a bunch of jobs, you know, like all sorts of international, you know, relations jobs, nonprofit, state department, all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, all of, you know, all up and down from New York to DC, uh, and in between. Right. And, um, I remember eventually, you know, I was, I was getting coming up like empty every time. And, uh, and Allie, uh, like my then girlfriend, now wife, as, as previously, uh, spoiler alert, um, the, um, I think, remember we, we were, we were away one, one weekend or something. And she said, you know, what have you been applying for? And I was like, well, I've just, I've just been avoiding church jobs. And she's like, what does that even mean? Like, what's a church job? And I was like, well, you know, I, I think in my mind, I was like in a church basement kind of a job. Um, she's like, well, what, what have you not been applying for? Like, what are the things out there? And I was like, well, there's a job at, at Catholic Relief Services that sounded good, but, um, but I don't, I don't want to get tangled up in, in, in church stuff. And she's like, well, like, maybe you should like give it a second pass. Um, and so I was like, all right, yeah, I guess you're right. I'll give it a shot. And, um, and the first one didn't work out, but there was like two at that time. And, um, and that was the one I got, uh, I applied for that. And I, I was like, oh, like, actually I do have these skills, right? Like the, the storytelling in the international studies was always kind of bolstered by faith and, and an interesting Catholic social teaching. Um, and, and again, a lot of liberation theology studies at, at Fairfield. Um, and so I kind of came to that interview at CRS and was really energized by the conversation. Be like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, I, I, I do have the vocabulary and the interest in this. Um, and, and that was, that worked out like, you know, just, just like that. Um, and, and so that was, um, you know, that would, that was a key moment because that, um, kind of ended my kind of wandering days up and down the East coast and, and put me in Baltimore where CRS is, is located. Um, and then also kind of pushed me into, um, you know, uh, uh, into the next chapter, which, which involved, you know, marriage and, and, um, and things like that. Like how, you know, we, it became a place to, to really build from, um, in, uh, to, to make a, you know, common story. Um, so that would be, I'll stop there again. <laughs> now, Eric, you, you introduced it. How, how, in a, if this is not too cheeky or too, or too, you know, too inappropriate, how does the story of your marriage and beginning a family fit into the trajectory you've been describing? Yeah. Um, so Ali and I had met. Um, Ali, Ali didn't ask me to ask you that question. I just came up with that on my. And when you want me to call her down, I can probably. Uh, yeah, ask Ali. No, yeah, lost. tell her to come, come down. Get leave her into the, the conversation. The kids, the um, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we we've been dating for a long time at Fairfield. It was, you know, one of those one of those freshman year things. Um, but um, but I think the the key moment. But she stood by you all this while. Yeah, get this girl down, Allie. Yeah, call Allie. I know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, she's good. She's great, right? Um, but the, um, I think for me, what kind of shifted in my mind was I had, um, 
I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go through grad school. I'm going to do all these things uh, before, um, you know, marriage. And it was, I think it was very, um, again, like me centered in, in some ways, you know, um, I think that's not a bad, again, not a bad option, but, but for me in that moment, it was again, very focused, I think coming out of Bolivia, like, well, how can I do this for me? Um, I think I, I, I realized, I think we realized together as we were kind of, um, you know, doing this kind of two year, we did a year apart, right? She was in Ecuador, I was in Bolivia, and then we did a year apart again. She was in Boston, I was, um, in, in Philly. Um, and I think it became clear that there was a, um, uh, a real desire to like any decision that I was making and that she was making, we were making together. There was that kind of coming together. How can we, you know, these aren't ind ind individual decisions anymore. This is a, a, a sense of a, a common decision we're trying to figure out together. Um, and I think the more that became clear, uh, the more it made sense, you know, okay, well, we're, we're, this is the trajectory we're on. Let's, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's kind of deepen it and, and, and go, go further. And, and that was, um, that was that was kind of how that that, that came to be um and then it would be another, another another year or so before we were we were married but that was a uh, um you know we had a lot of years behind us and then um hopefully a lot of years ahead <laughs> what about discernment how did discernment fit into deciding to be married yeah i mean i think there's that that same sense of what are the patterns um from the past you know what's you know i think that and i think you have these kind of stories being kind of woven together you know and and i think there's uh, you know, the, the foundation becomes more and more evident that you're standing on. Um, and I think you, you're, you're, again, you're looking into the, into the future too, you know, where, where are we headed? I, I really think for me, it was, um, on, on my side, at least that sense of, um, this, we're, we're already kind of falling more and more into a, a shared life together. Um, and, and not falling, that sounds like the opposite of discernment, but we've been making these intentional steps um, to, to, um, to deepen, you know, connections and deepen our ties. Um, and, um, and so, uh, it, it was, it, I was, I mean, I think that was the, where, where we, where we were going. I mean, I, I don't think I made a pros and cons list. I think it was kind of a, a, a it's just a natural kind of outpouring of, of where we had been into where we were going. Um, yeah. Thanks, Eric. Eric, you've mentioned a couple of times uh, the name of a man whom many of us uh, in this in this group have uh, have great admiration for, and that's Jim Bowler. And you mentioned that he's still your spiritual director. Do you mind saying a little bit more about the role that he's played in your life, or also the role of uh, of spiritual direction, and uh, how has that? Um, sounds like it's been a real pillar in your uh, or a kind of a you know, uh, a steady, a steady, a steady force in your own growth. So Jim Bowler and the process of spiritual direction, what has it done for you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of, not a lot of stuff, right. I, um, uh, Jim and I, I think we first met sophomore year, second half of so my second year. And, um, and it was, again, it was kind of a, um, a fruit of, of kind of a prayer experience that I had had that, um, um, working on some of the kind of a version of the 19th annotation at Fairfield. Um, and, uh, it just, I was working with the spiritual director, um, kind of through that. And then, um, I, I don't know, just a series of events. I, I ended up kind of meeting Father Bowler and, um, and, and we, we connected, I, I don't even remember how we kind of originally fell in, but it, but it became this, this, this relationship that then, you know, he, you know, I, I was seeing him with, with some regularity, um, sophomore year, junior year, senior year. And, um, and, and for me in that time, you know, like, a, like, you know, you're, you're a, you're a college student, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on in your mind all the time. And, and I think he was a real anchoring force. Um, I think he was able to, the thing that he said that I think really blew my mind was God delights in you. Um, he said that early, he said it often. And I think that sense of God delighting in me, um, in my story and who I am, who I'm becoming, um, was just really groundbreaking. And then he, he gave me, he introduced me to Henry Nowen, uh, the, the, the book, um, The Prodigal, Return of the Prodigal Son. We read it together. Well, I think he'd already read it. I read it and he, he knew what I was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, um, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, he kind of, he kind of, I, I know it's just, he helped me kind of find God in, in, in my experiences and, and to, I think, really uh, mature my faith as a, as a college student. Um, and, and again, like anchor, anchor myself and also grow. Um, 
and then uh, and then he's been a you know a, a good friend and resource um, afterwards. Um, he 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 actually married us. It was um, and um, and he did a he did a pre cana uh, for us, which was again like so intentional and so just kind of weaving us together. And I think that part of it was um, you know in spiritual direction you're sharing kind of how how the spirits at work in your life, um, but you're also obviously sharing a lot about your about who you are. Um, and, and, and Father Buller is just really good. Maybe, maybe all spiritual directors are, but I don't know. Father Buller is just really good at hearing what you're saying and kind of storing it away and then bringing it back at key moments, um, to help you see the patterns. He was, he, again, he was the person who really, um, reminded me that God works in patterns in our lives. Like, again, the raw, the raw stuff of our, of our days, um, isn't just like random and to be discarded, but it's actually these moments where we might be able to detect God at work if, if we kind of are, are able to sort back through it. Um, and so, um, you know, that was really helpful to me, really powerful to me. And then during the pandemic, um, so, so we had, I mean, we were in touch, you know, maybe a couple times a year. Um, but then during the pandemic, I, I was looking for a spiritual director. I, I needed to kind of, you know, get back, uh, you know, kind of into, into my spiritual life more, uh, more intentionally. Um, I forget how, I don't know, like he sent, like there was an email at a random time. It was very, you know, like, you know, random. Um, and uh, I reached out, I was like, hey, you know, Jim, do you, are you up for taking on a direct, direct E? And he's like, oh man, like, yes, let's do it. And so oh. that, that began again. And then, um, and then we, we, we just did the 19th annotation, um, and, which again, I kind of had said like, you know, do you think I should do this? And he's like, I've been waiting for you to, to ask. Um, and, um, uh, and so it's just, it's just been, yeah, I mean, and because we've he's known me for so long, um, he's able to really detect those patterns and, and remind me of things that I might, um, you know, not immediately think of. Uh, and um, I think that's I think that's the role of a good spiritual director is to really kind of reflect back to you, um, you know, how God sees you, how God is working with you, not to tell you what to do, because um, he, he definitely doesn't do that. Um, but to but to reflect God at work in your life and to um, and to help you do the work. And I'm always amazed, um, you know, over these last many months when we've been doing the uh, uh, the 19 annotation, um, um, how much fruit from my prayer um, is made known in those conversations to the point where I'm like, Jim, I feel like I was, you know, I feel like we're doing all the work here. Like, I feel like I didn't do the, do the homework. And he's like, this is, this is why we talk like, so that the yeah. you know, spirit can pull this stuff out of you. And it's not just like you sitting alone in a chair in your room. Um, and uh, yeah. And I, you know, so it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's an important relationship. I mean, he's just a uh, one of a kind and um, um, yeah. That's Eric, story. let me, let me ask you then what you've just described in effect uh, what you do with Jim uh, with Jim Qua spiritual director is you tell your story right and what happens when you are telling the story and he's listening and what is he doing with this story what are the pair of you doing with this story well if anyone knows Jim Bowler he usually sits very quietly and and forces you to keep talking which which is uh, real annoying when you think you've said everything you want to say but um but it's so good right because I mean essentially what he's doing right is, is there's that sense of of going back and collecting the raw material of your life, um, you know, the, the immediate past, you know, day, week, whatever it might be, um, but then going back and putting it in context, assembling the pieces in a way um, that that you see <clears> that you see God has has been at work, right? Um, and that you see, I think, too, mo you know, more importantly, is that God is still at work, um, and, and God is still creating, um, and not just in you, but in the world, right? Uh, you know, that that, the, that creation goes on. Um, and, and, you know, there's that sense of, 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 um, you're frozen air in the world. So, sorry, go ahead. That's how we, we, you got frozen, but I was going to say, all right, now, you know, so you were, you were reminding us that in spiritual direction, you experience that God is still working. So what's the Lord up to now in this latest phase of your life where you have to work with these Jesuits? What's uh, what, what are the patterns that you observe, and how, uh, you know, uh, how how do you see God continuing to work in you in this most recent phase of your life, uh, in your position now, uh, which is a position of great trust and of great influence, uh, and of you know of significant uh, public uh, effect, and in your latest phase as husband and father. 
What's the Lord doing now? How would you tell your the story of what the Lord is doing now? Yeah. Well, can I can I just I, can I rewind just for one moment? Sure, I think it's, please. Um, so when I was at Catholic Relief Services, um, I, I have a um, which I was there for about six six years and change, and um, and I. Um, you know, I, I would think like, is this, am I in the right place? Is this the right spot? You know, I remember I would take the bus with with Hopkins students um, uh, here. I'm, I'm in Baltimore, so Johns Hopkins med students. Um, and I think, man, like those folks are really doing something like important. These are these are doctors and nurses and you know all these practitioners are saving lives. Um, and I remember th- th- realizing a that um, you know that sense of wanting to do good manifests in different ways, right? One person's a doctor. One person is you know whatever I am doing at, at CRS. And that's okay, uh, and that's part of that 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 understanding of your story, and then trusting those values to manifest themselves in unique and important ways. Um, and then I remember, you know, one day at CRS. So it, when I was at CRS, I, I worked um, for a long time on CRS Rice Bowl, which is the Lenten program. And um, I think I realized one day, like, geez, whiz, here I am sitting here writing stories of international consequence f- for a faith-based community, you know. And, motivated by faith, using faith as an expression for, for faith formation. I was like, this, this is it. Like I found the intersection. And for a long time, I, um, I thought I would do like, and I'm still very interested in like peace building work and, and, and really kind of doing more in that international relations, um, space, but, but then realized, and I talked to some, some, when I was kind of looking for grad, grad schools, talking to colleagues and being like, what do you think I should do? Like, what, what would you, what would you pitch me as? And everyone says, oh, a communications guy. I was like, really? And it turns out that they were right. So I, I got my master's at American University in International Media, which again was that intersection of storytelling, but across different platforms um, and international studies. And so, you know, it became so, so serious. I mean, great, great organization, right? Doing a lot of good work. And I really enjoyed my time there. But then the opportunity to, to work with the Jesuit conference, um, you know, the it was it was it was kind of a, an opportunity that that materialized um and and um it was an even deeper opportunity to engage with with faith um, that does justice and storytelling. And so there's still that international backdrop. Um, but but as you said, you know, Father Blaschek, from from that sense of, um, of 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 a new kind of mission. And I think what what animates me most about the work there is that it's um, you know like the Jesuit conference. Like folks probably don't know what it is or what it does. It's it's kind of part of like the governing structure of of the Society of Jesus in the United States and the reports to Rome. It's kind of an odd thing if you're if you're just like looking at it on paper. But what the mission is, is the mission is the society, like the society of Jesus. The mission is reconciliation in the world. How are we helping folks like find the way to God? Um, and, and my task is that sense of telling stories that are going to kind of lead people from their own lives, you know, the, the, the nitty grittiness of their lives um, through the mystery of the world and then hopefully to God. Um, and, and so it, again, it's, it's, like to sit here and track back, it makes a lot of sense, right? Oh, I, of course I went from A to B to C to D. Um, but there are those moments where I recognized, oh, geez, like, like I think I've, like, here's a grace. Like this, this was a, uh, you know, the culmination, a manifestation of, of what I was studying at Fairfield that seemed so random and disparate, but actually, um, you know, is, is integral to what I do and who I am now. Um, and then the opportunity to write, you know, to write has been a real, a real, a real gift as well. And, and, um, and I love it, you know, it, it's a form of prayer for me to, to make it, it's the literal, what we've been talking about, right? It's the literal making, taking the raw material, making sense of it in a way that might be helpful to other people, and then just firing it off into the void and hoping it does. Um, and that's, you know, that's an opportunity, that's an exercise in humility. That's an exercise in rejection because God knows I get plenty of those emails, and um, and it's an exercise in um, and I think hopefully manifesting the, those gifts. Um, then you asked about just kind of my life as a as a father and, and a husband. Um, I mean, you know, I I, it, I mean, it, what what's what's there to say, right? It's it's great. There's 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 challenges. There's there's a lot of joys. There's um, opportunity to really see the world. Um, through different eyes, right? And, and folks that, you know, have kids or interact with kids or um, have seen a kid once, like, you know, like um, the I mean, like the mermaid thing, right? The mermaid thing is a perfect example of, 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 of wanting to go to the Renaissance Fair, which I love. I always go to the Renaissance Fair on my own accord. Um, but then f- going to this, let me, let me paint the picture, right? It's this enormous tank and they have these, you know, these, these people in the tank, you know, they're, they're in costume um, and, uh, and they're, and, and they're, they're, they're the mermaids. And you have in front of the tank 
that's this pirate, right? And he's at, he's taking questions about the mermaids. Um, that's not for me, but, but, but um, like, I'm not gonna ask a question, but, but my daughters are fascinated. And so that opportunity to, um, to see that excitement and that wonder and awe um, and the curiosity. And, and in some ways the, um, the, that, that sense of like, yeah, like the, what I, what I hope for is real, um, you know, through, through their eyes is um, it's just super powerful, you know, and, it, and it's important. And I think it, it grounds us um, um, in like the fantastical, um, you know, and I think also it's an opportunity to, to check, to check myself uh, when I get frustrated, you know, when uh, no one eats their dinner or everyone's screaming or, you know, it, you know I think those are also, also opportunities for grace, um, though less, less pleasant than the mermaid one. Thank you, Eric. Look, I, I you know, I want to give, we're getting, Jess, we're getting near the end, right? But Eric, I wanted to ask you, uh, help us when we think here, we always say at fair field that we're committed to our alumni and alumnae and to the community way beyond the time when of commencement and you know separate from the times when they return for alum for reunions uh looking back at your time at fairfield and this this of course involves your taking seriously the story you've told us and that you tell yourself um what would you want us to be sure that we're still doing or that we should do better for our students, for our alumni, and for the wider community. Because we always want to be looking at the modges. You know, how can we be more available, more present, more responsive, uh, and provide the best possible education that we can for mission purposes, not just, as you say, uh, to give our students the economic needs, you know, opportunities that they deserve. But looking back and looking forward, help us understand from your perspective, because you are so reflective and clearly your education here has meant so much to you in your own story. What would you want us to be sure we're still doing or do better for our students, for our alumni, for the wider community? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's, that, um, I think there's that sense of, I, I mean, for me, like, like I had no experience of Ignatian spirituality before I came to Fairfield, and so that was was really grounding for me. And that doesn't mean everyone needs to do the exercises, but I think it means that folks need to have the opportunity to encounter a God who delights in them, and then a reminder that God delights in you and everybody else. And so I think that opportunity to meet everybody else. Who God delights in, um, and, and have that reflection of you know the people of God, um, you know in in education uh, opportunities to, to travel and see that, and 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 even to experience it on campus, right? I think is um, is key, and I think that's where that that sense of God delights in me, God delights in you. Let's work together to to make sure you know the world is a, is a just place. You know that that, that we've, we've we've we're we're unraveling you know injustices um, as we see them. Um, I think that's that's key, and I, I think for me, like any work for justice that I do or or like support or or, or pretend to support, right, is is all faith driven because at the end of the day, you know, I could I can, you know, get comfortable in my life, but I can never um, like forget that that God delights in other people, that God delights in everybody, and that we're all um, we're all in this together, right? That 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 I see, you know, Jesus. Um, you know, uh, homeless and, and, and poor, right? And I think that that, um, that reminder is, is key. And it makes, it makes me uncomfortable as I go through Baltimore. And I think that's important that, that we have that sense of discomfort. And I think that stems from that, that faith life of God delighting in us. And it, and it ends then in the kind of the, uh, the nitty grittiness of, of, of our lived experiences, um, you know, doing good in, in whatever unique way we're, we're, we're have the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Eric. Father Jerry, we do have a question. Dorothy has submitted. She says, Dorothea, I am a mentor. Thank you. So this question relates to the program. If you think back to your experiences sophomore year, is there anything in terms of activities, mentor program, academic program that you remember as making a difference? 
Yeah. So let me, I'll give you a very specific kind of a, a okay. random answer. I took a class. One of the classes I took was philosophical Taoism and Zen Buddhism. And um, it was, uh, we spent half the time um, like shooting b bows right in front of the library, um, shooting arrows and, and to practice Buddhism. And we're like, man, this is an easy A. This is great. Um, and it wasn't a hard class. Um, but honest to God, I go back to, and I, again, Jim Bowler said to me while I was taking, because I was like, I'm really interested in Taoism. And he said, um, in spiritual direction that year, sophomore year, junior year, it's important to have an understanding of a, of a, of a faith tradition, of a way of a, a religious tradition that is not your own and, and ideally isn't even Western. He's like, so he was like, go all in, find, find Jesus at work in that. And I, uh, I don't, my, the whole shelf might follow me. I would take the book off, but I found, but, but I, I remember, um, again, like, uh, you know, we were, one of the books we had to read was the, the Tao Te Ching. Um, and I remember being really like attracted to that. Uh, and then I, it was really, some of it was really helpful to me, um, after coming back from Bolivia, because they talk a lot about, um, um, rejection there, there's a lot of like the like the the, the 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 standard of christ in that and then i found this book like this really like kind of random book called christ the eternal Tao, written by a monk of a uh, of a kind of a i know like a desert tradition i don't i don't know what tradition but he but rewrote the Tao Te Ching for christianity um and it became that window like a different entry point for um for me as a catholic um to to more deeply grapple with um, the, uh, uh, you know, the gospel, right? Um, and, and then more deeply understand the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the standard of Christ. Um, and so, like, you know, what started as an easy A has actually probably been one of the most, like, long-term classes that have been affecting me. And I write about it a lot, and I write about it um, in, in that, in, in Cannonball Moments. I have a, I'm working on another book that, I, that there's a lot of that in there. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, it's kind of, again, it was kind of like a throwaway thought, thought, and then it became actually really important. Um, so that was one thing. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a time, I mean, also those retreats. I remember the more, more obvious answer would be the, the retreats that were really powerful moments to kind of get away and, um, and grapple with stuff in community. Eric, I hope you don't find it. Uh, I'll look at, I'm an, I'm an old man, so I can stay, say stupid and, and sentimental things, but we are so deeply proud of you. Uh, of the man you are and the man you've become uh, and the man uh, who who gives back to the world and gives back to your alma mater. So we are so immensely grateful and proud of you. Uh, I can't think, and this is not to cast dispersions about any of the people who are going to succeed you in this series, but if we're going to launch a series called Alumni Lives, Alumni Stories, Lives That Inspire, can't think of a better way to start than having this opportunity to be with you, Eric. So uh, you. in the names of Janet Canepa and Jessica and all of our friends here at Fairfield and all those who have been participating, Eric, a million thanks uh, and uh, continue to live the life you do that will inspire us. God bless you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Father Jerry and Eric. We'll be sending out a couple of links where you can find some of Eric's writings. I'll send a link where you can check out his book if you do want to read that. Um, so look for that email in the next couple of days. <laughs> Father Jerry is the biggest hype man we have. <laughs> we are just firming up the next date for the, the series. So look for that to come in February and we'll be sending out some promotional information about that in the weeks to come. But thank you all again. I hope you have a wonderful evening and God bless. Thanks again, everybody. Thank and thank you, Eric.